is they give you that kind of range of motion that so people find mind-blowing. He, he mainly used two different types of dips. But why were they so shredded specifically? Well, okay, so I want to kick things off by going back to when you first got into Arnold. You mentioned photocopying your first Arnold muscle mag at your friend's house and watching Arnold in the movie Predator at age 14. Yeah, As yeah, a historian perfect. of bodybuilding and Arnold, can you talk about how Arnold developed such a massive chest in as much detail as possible? Oh, man, uh, I could, but that's going to almost be a spoiler alert <laughs> because um, I'll, 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 I mean, I'm at, at your show, so I'm, I'm going to talk about it. But um, yeah, I wanted to actually do a full series. Of, I've been getting asked so many times, Carlos, can you please do a full series of Arnold, everything from when he was a teenager all the way up to his, you know, to his Olympia wins. And I mean, let me put it this way. When I went to his house, when I was doing research for for the Netflix series several years ago, um, his friend introduced me to his actual home gym, right? Because it's there in his house. His house is now a museum. And um, there was this amazing, you know, old equipment there. And I immediately recognized the bench that was in the corner. And it's a moon bench. And I don't know if you've heard of those, but no. they're uh, like a flat bench. And then at the edge of it, there's like a, a semicircle. Yeah. Right. And in the past, old school bodybuilders used to do a lot of rib cage expansion exercises like um, pullovers or flies and, and work on the breathing aspect of them to really expand their chest. And his school friend who who runs the museum told me, you know, that's the secret to Arnold's chest. He did thousands and thousands of flies on this bench. I'm like, aha, you know, I, I knew there was something special, you know. And so a lot of his, I would say, his initial work on his chest, because even he's talked about it in his books that before he came to America, all he obsessed about was his chest and arms. That's all he cared about, right? And you can see it in his early photos from the Mr. Universe competition in 1966. I mean, the guy has had the biggest chest and arms ever seen, right? And, um, yeah, I mean, it has to do with all these old school exercises that he did as, as a very young um, practitioner. So we're talking a lot of breathing exercises like pullovers and flies and endless benching endless benching i mean that's basically what he did that was his meat and potatoes to develop his chest um he had never done cable crossovers um before he came to you know vince's gym or gold's gym that was taught to him then but the majority of of, of muscle mass that he gained in his chest was mainly through those basic exercises i just mentioned you know uh, structurally to really expand his rib cage, pullovers and flies, and in different variations in the bench. That's really what, what it is. Um, I know he also did a lot of dips, endless dips. Um, that's the only other thing he did. But, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's that's Arnold's. Uh, it's not really a secret, you know. The, 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 if the secret, if anything, was just... He was so obsessed with having such a huge chest, you know, that he would just train it all the time. And if you've read his his specific booklets about chest training, it's it's insane. Like he, he when he says that he would sometimes just go off to the Bavarian forests and take weights with him, right, with a mate, and and they would just do like fifty or hundred sets. He's not kidding. Just for chest, that's what he would do literally until he couldn't lift the, the bloody bar anymore, right? And so he was just so obsessed in, in growing those particular body parts that he would literally just train it until he couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, so yeah. just the volume and the intensity was just yeah. insane. Yeah, it was insane. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, you mentioned the dip. So can you explain the Gironda dip and how he maybe used it for lower chest? Well, he, he mainly used two different types of dips. The, the standard dip, which we all know is just a straight up and down dip, um, does work the lower pec to some, ext to, to, to some I guess, degree. Um, but it's also very direct on, on the triceps. When I understand that 
he had very little bodybuilding knowledge uh, because he started off training as an Olympic weightlifter in Austria. Right. Um, then he really got into powerlifting after meeting Franco. And he learned a lot more body. He did learn some bodybuilding techniques in Austria, but very little. When he went to Munich and really started to be exposed to the now, you could say international, but mainly European competition and, and getting to, uh, I guess, become friends with, you, you could say, uh, universe competitors who are now world-class athletes. They started learning. He started learning much more, a greater, a greater repertoire of exercises. Um, and um, you, sorry, now I've, now I've kind of gotten, gotten off track to what I wanted to say. Oh, no, it's um, all good. But you, you were asking specifically about, oh, my God, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I was talking about uh, what he did for his chest specifically, but I was. Yeah, well, I was oh, yeah, it did. Sorry, dips. Yeah. Um, and so it's funny because when he arrives in America, he realizes that he mainly has been just working on bulk this whole time just to be the biggest bodybuilder in history. That was his obsession. And he obviously got that, right? He was 250 pounds, but he wasn't, I wouldn't say, very experienced in bodybuilding yet. He hadn't won anything except the universe a couple of times, and he thought he could just, you know, hop on a plane and, and beat everybody in the U.S. And, and be crowned champion. And he got a horrible... Um, you know, awakening when he got beaten by Frank Zane. And it's funny because when he walks into Vince's gym the very first time, and I've actually got photos of that, he's looking really smooth. And no wonder you hear the stories of Vince Ronda saying, you know, you're nothing but a, you know, a big fat F, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, when you look at how smooth he was, you can understand why Vince said that. And, um, it's there where he started to learn how to refine his physique. And if you look at the photos from the 1968 uh, Mr. America, right, and compare it to 1969, where he's now got cuts all the way up to his hips and his thighs and, and you know, he's just got the serratus coming out and all these things, uh, you know, much more ripped. Um, he's, he really started learning about how to refine his body through – correct exercise specific using specific exercises because exercises are tools right and specific nutrition which wasn't all about gaining weight anymore right um and and so he started really learning the intricacies of different exercises and no longer was he doing did he find necessary to do weighted dips anymore instead he was chiseling out his physique using the Geronda dip for an exa as an example, right? Um, although not like Larry Scott where he had his hands turned in, he would do it the regular style, but still um, with with hands in a, in a neutral position and just a normal anatomical neutral position would perform those dips, right? So, And he learned those, of course, at, at Vince's gym, just like he learned so many other things at Vince's gym. Awesome. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Arnold documentary and, you know, getting to check out his gym. Can you give me another maybe highlight in terms of working on that? Uh, I'm sure it was a cool experience. Um, in all honesty, um, I heard that he was down in Austria and I, and I, and because of work, I actually couldn't make the trip, but I was going to meet him and, and all that. Uh, really, they, I can't say that there was really a highlight, you know, um, I simply would work mostly on, on my weekends because it's just, you know, this kind of thing I do as a hobby still. Yeah. Um, and I would, I mean, yeah, I would, I would do a lot of, a lot of this is specifically for the Netflix project. I would spend at times quite a lot of my weekends on them, but I really enjoyed it. You know, it brought me a lot of joy. If anything, there wasn't really a highlight until the end when it finally came out, you know? That was the, the, the prize, really, um, just to see my name, you know, and having contributed to, to telling the story of my idol. That was just, it's priceless, you know. And uh, for that, I'm, I'm always grateful that I was chosen for that, you know. Yeah, that's, that's so awesome, man. Um, <laughs> so when we were talking about Arnold, you mentioned the, the pullover and expanding the rib cage. 
Yeah. Do you feel like the pullover is an underrated lift today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting because I was just talking to this about to some of my clients because I, I, I'm also, again, it's a hobby, but I I, um, I do have clients where, who I teach old school lifting techniques. And when we look at the evolution of the fitness industry, it's heavily based on the history of bodybuilding. And I can tell you this as well because I've helped Alex Ardenti on several of his uh, documentaries on the history of bodybuilding. And we can see that whether we're looking at the supplement industry or the fitness industry, as in the, the actual gym industry, these industries spawned from firstly physical culture and then bodybuilding, right? With the with truly the there's a big boom happening after pumping iron in the 80s, right? Late 70s, bodybuilding starts becoming very glamorous. And by the 1980s, there's gyms everywhere, right? Um, and so who are they modeling? this fitness industry against they modeled to what they see and they saw bodybuilding the birth of all these machines and suddenly they realize okay this is how it's supposed to be done but a lot of the stuff that that got i guess passed on to the 80s and 90s became more filtered down and i would say more specialized in that basically you walk into most gyms today and you're barely going to see any free weights. You're going to see mostly machines, machines, machines. And the reason I'm saying all this is because only recently with channels like my own and others, we're starting to reintroduce a lot of these old school techniques. And now I'm starting to see a resurgence of a lot of these old school techniques uh, come back in popularity. And I see it as a, as a very good thing. And I want to get to answer your question, but I need to bring everything into context, right? Um, now it seems that it's not just about getting the pump. It's not just about getting, you know, losing fat and building muscle, which has been, you know, the, I guess, the way to go for the last 40 years. Now people are seeing beyond that and increasing their range of motion and their strength in the most extreme ranges of motion, right? And so the reason I say all that is because now we're starting to see the dumbbell pullover really make a resurgence again. Um, you've got channels like, uh, of course, my own that I've been raving about dumbbell pullover since I started, right? Um, but now you're seeing channels like, uh, you know, in, on Instagram, Lucas Hardy talk about um, from range of strength, great guy as well. Um, you know, talking about the dumbbell pullover for spinal mobility, for, for shoulder mobility, for everything, right? And also the recent, um, you know, who everyone's talking about now, knees over toes, Ben Patrick, right? He also talks about the dumbbell pullover. And, you know, all this stuff, even, you know, when I looked at knees over toes program, no, no disrespect to him whatsoever. I love the fact how he's packaged everything together, right? I think it's brilliant. But every exercise that he's ever talked about if you look back enough, you'll find that all these exercises that look at increasing the range of motion and having strength in these range of motions um, all come back from, you know, they all stem and spawn from, from old school lifting. So uh, they just have different names and most people don't know about this stuff, right? So, yeah, I think the dumbbell pullover, just to come back full circle to your question, as well as many other exercises um, are underrated because... When you look, and this is another thing I, I hear, you look at Arnold doing, for example, cable crossovers, right, in pumping iron yeah. or dumbbell flies. And the one thing people say is, how the hell does he bring his elbows so far back, right? Exactly. Yeah, you're nodding. Yeah. Everybody else is like, damn, his range of motion was insane. But that's the point I'm getting at. Um, you got to understand that all these old school techniques came before machines, right and now they're making a comeback because people i guess like myself and others are exposing this to this generation of people and machines really were not as popular uh until the 1970s really when when nautilus came out before that there weren't there were barely any machines there were some but not many and so the majority of people truly 
cultivated their physiques using free weights and really learning how to stabilize and how to um, you know move through greater ranges of motion. It's truly really a different, different art back then. And yeah, I think the dumbbell pullover, like many other exercises, are underrated because they give you that kind of range of motion that so people find mind-blowing. You know, How is it that knees over toes can do what he can? How is it that Arnold could bring his elbow so far back? It's because they were able to load in, you know, the, the load in these very extreme ranges of motion. Of course, you can't do it overnight. It takes time. It takes a lot of time to develop. But I love that there's a resurgence of these old school techniques, which are going to give people um, a greater repertoire of exercises and, and skills to work on, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That reminds me, um, I think you said that there's a difference between muscle building and bodybuilding. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and, and what you, you've just said kind of makes me think about that where it's like, there's yeah. more than just building the muscle. Like yeah. he's working on building the range of motion and the mobility. Yeah. Even. Well, this is the thing, like you've touched on, on something that I always emphasize on, on my online clients that I have on my online coaching program. I tell them that I do true bodybuilding. I don't do muscle building. I do bodybuilding. To me, what truly bodybuilding is, is building the body from the inside out. And this is the thing, like, mark my word, people are now moving into the second of five different exercise types that exist. I'm glad you brought this up. People have mainly been introduced for the last few decades to the exercises that build maybe, you know, maybe two, strength and muscle. Yeah. Okay. And by strength, I mean the strengthening of the tendons, ligaments, and joints, as well as I guess the particular fast twitch muscle fiber, which which uh, develops explosive power and strength, right? Which we use in mostly anaerobic um, workouts. Then you've got the type of exercise that truly builds the muscle size because it's a more cardiovascular style of exercise, like Vince Gironda would, for example, would would um, would, would talk about. And this, of course, expands the capillaries and multiplies them and, and, and increases the, the, the sarcomere size and, and volume of, of your muscles, right? I'm talking, excuse me if I'm talking too scientific here, but you're also talking to a medical scientist here. So um, I'm, I'm trying to really explain the, the, the different facets here of exercise. It's, it, and this gets me to a point of, of what I read from Bob Hoffman a very long time ago, that there are five different types of exercises, those that build muscle, those that, that, that build strength, speed, flexibility, and those that build your organs. Now, this is a really radical concept, and I can see you're just like listening, right? <laughs> because most people don't see it like this. And, and I love Arnold's quote from his book in, in the Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. Exercises are tools, just like when you walk into a hardware shop. You need to know which tool you're going to pick out because if you choose the wrong tool, you're not going to get the correct result. He's absolutely right. Not everybody can go ahead and do a sissy squat, <laughs> right? Are, are you going to, me as a coach, would I actually give that to an 80-year-old man? I'd have to be insane, right? Or maybe he can do it because he's been practicing Qigong and yoga for the last 50 years. Yeah. But I can't give it to him if he's been in, doing IT for the last 60 years. <laughs> not, that, not that the IT industry has <laughs> existed for that long, but you understand what I'm trying to say, right? There's the right tool for the right person for the right result. Going back to the, the principles of, of, of how to use these exercises, and I said, mark my word, people are only just realizing that exercises, in specifically resistance training, can be used to expand your range of motion and to be strong in the most extreme ranges of motion. They're now starting to understand that principle. But what about the other principles? What about exercises for building your body from the inside out, your organs? You know, those that, I mean, the organs are called vital organs for a reason because vital means that they are of absolute importance for your survival. Without them, you can't live, right? And there are exercises that tone and strengthen the organs. And as people become 
more aware of old school techniques, eventually they're going to realize the importance of exercises that also build your lung capacity, improve your heart efficiency, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. That's the kind of stuff again that I teach in my online coaching. But but this goes back to what I to what we've been just talking about, the dumbbell pullover. You know, that's an excellent exercise for toning your cardiovascular system because it has a, a very deep effect, not just on the muscles, but on your whole breathing apparatus. It's fantastic. So yeah, that's a great lens to think through things, right? Like I know we're so focused sometimes on optimizing muscle building, mm -hmm. but there's so much more to bodybuilding. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, you want the muscle to grow, right? At the very basic level, a gym bro wants their muscle to pump. But what's causing the pump? Blood. Mm -hmm. What's, you know, making the blood reach the muscle? Your heart. So how about not just think about the muscle, but the cardiovascular system in its totality? Don't you think if you have a greater, more efficient cardiovascular system, your pump will be that much better? I definitely think so. Won't that mean that your recovery should be better too because you have a greater cardiovascular system should mean that if your lungs are working more efficiently, you're going to get rid of toxins faster. Lactic acid as well will break down faster because uh, your, your, your pulmonary system, for example, is one of the main acid base um, stabilizers of your body. They, the, 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 the lungs, for example, through the, um, introduction of carbon dioxide creates carbonic acid. And therefore, this is one of the, the greatest buffers, for example, in your body system. So people talk about, oh, I want to alkalize and this and that. Don't want to have an acidic body. Hello. <laughs> Improve your cardiovascular system, right? Yeah. There's so much to talk about here, right? But my point is that, yeah, I, I love talking truly about bodybuilding. Build your body. You want super muscles? Have super organs. Love that. Yeah, That's great. So I want to move in a little bit of a different direction. Sure. Um, for the people who don't know, can you explain what the Bronze Era is and uh, why they were so shredded? <laughs> yeah, great. Um, this is a good question, actually, one that I probably have never been asked before. But um, the Bronze Era was the era, as least, as least, at least as I defined it, right, because I was the one that defined the eras, several years ago because i kept seeing you know these periods and these things that occurred during each period you know mainly you had strong men who were just starting to dabble into bodybuilding right uh, and, and physique physique photography became a thing right and, and and you can see then that from the 1930s onwards suddenly these robust athletic looking physiques that were ripped started to get a little bit more smooth and massive right we're talking all these guys were well over 200 pounds now or you know or 90 kilos whichever system you, you like to use and and their chest swelled up their legs became more massive um all of these structural changes and, and massive muscle gains were made as well as um the birth of powerlifting. Right. All of these things happened during the silver era, which I defined it as 1930s until I believe it was the uh, 1960s. Each is like a 30 period, a 30 year period. And then I defined it at the end of the 1960s, the end of the silver era, because at that point is when um, the first truly effective anabolic steroids came on the scene and the first experimentation began to occur. And from the 1960s until about the 90s is when you have the golden era. So just to introduce the fact that I stated this in, in several videos um, several years ago, and it caught on. Now everybody kind of defines that, you know. And going to your question about the Bronze Era, well, the Bronze Era is a very fascinating era that I find because um, in the Silver Era, you really see as I said, powerlifting take off. The all the odd lifts become organized into Olympic um, lifting, you know, Olympic weightlifting, and you see truly bodybuilding. So you basically see 
physical culture become organized into three major sports. And as that occurs, people become very organized and very focused on, on either focusing on an individual part of the iron game or maybe a couple of them, right? Yeah. And towards the golden era, that then they just completely become separate, right? You're either a lift, an Olympic weightlifter, a powerlifter, or a bodybuilder. Everyone's be, everyone becomes so focused on their pursuit, right? In the bronze era, there was no such thing. They were all phenomenal athletes, capable of doing all kinds of things, way more functional than I would dare to say than today's bodybuilders, right? They were, in my opinion, all-round athletes. If you look at the way they trained, and sure, I introduced uh, the light dumbbell system, yep. you know, Sandow system, by, by studying the system. But most people think that that's the be all and end all of the of the bronze era, which is definitely not the case. If you actually read Sandow's system of physical training, um, Sandow literally, out of um, answering the demands of the public, right after he gave his ex his exhibition, I believe it at the World Fair in Paris, um, which made him a, a global phenomenon. Um, he decided to address the public. Okay, they want to know what I do. This is what I do. And he wrote his program down. But many people forget that after the light dumbbell system, he talks about muscle control and he talks like he used to continually flex on trains and, and as he's going from city to city that he trained on because he didn't have dumbbells or any weights with him, he would just do muscle control work, right? Um, and then when he would reach his destination, he would perform his odd lifts, right? So that's truly a good, you know, snippet of what bronze era training was like. But even then, Sandow was a gymnast, you know, and he was an apt um, hand balancer and all these other things. So bronze era training was truly multidimensional. You had elements of bodybuilding. You had elements of, of isometric training and, and muscle control posing, right? You had very athletic um, uh, styles of training like gymnastics and weightlifting, except back then it was odd lifting. And to be truly recognized as a strong man, you had to be, um, I guess, capable of not just doing two lifts like it is now today in Olympic weightlifting. You, sh you had to be capable of doing one arm and two arm lifts of all sorts with different apparatuses kettlebells, ring weights, dumbbells, uh, you know, globe barbells, and even odd looking things, right? To prove your, your strongmanism, so to speak, right? And yet to be also a performer and an entertainer. So the bronze era was truly a, a special era in that, in that regard, um, in that athletes were not so focused on one endeavor alone. They were truly all-round athletes they looked like they did because of that reason they weren't just focused on being the biggest bodybuilder on, on the planet no they were they, they were interested in their strength in their flexibility in their muscle tone and all these other things right why did they look the way they looked well i'm kind of answering that but why were they so shredded specifically well firstly they didn't obsess about eating six meals a day <laughs> they actually ate um at most two to three times a day right and and also i think at least from well not that i think from what i've discussed with several professors ac academics that have studied all of this plus having read everything that i've read um many were into fasting and i've talked about this um they actually at times especially through muscle control this is something i learned from a professor martinez who was one of the last teachers of muscle control and he then taught me so i'm kind of keeping muscle control alive right now awesome. um, again through my coaching services and he told me that first of all bronze era athletes were aware of the importance of fasting and two muscle control allowed them to survive on less calories and so most of them were, were on kind of like a thousand um calories a, yeah a thousand calories a day 
Wow. And therefore, they were able to maintain that ripped and shredded condition. But because they had more efficiency in using their muscles, um, they found that they could kind of cruise at 1,000 calories. That's crazy. Whereas if you, if you talk to a bodybuilder nowadays, you know, they're, they're all, they've got that death face and then they're ripped to shreds, but they can't wait to, to, to eat a pizza, right? <laughs> but these bronze era athletes were kind of conditioned over many years to, to just be stable at such a low amount of calorie, because especially the calorie intake, especially because they, com- they, they train muscle control. And why was muscle control so important? Because it allows you to use your muscles efficiently without too much energy expenditure. And so by that, I mean, they were able to relax everything that they needed to relax and purely concentrate on what needed to be contracted, right? And therefore, in doing so, they wasted a lot less ATP, right, which is necessary for contraction, therefore less energy, therefore less calorie intake. And they were able to do so also by controlling breath. They were masters at what the Indians now call, or the yogis, pranayama, breath work. Right. Mm-hmm. This is something else that, you know, you tell a bodybuilder, do you do breath work? What the hell is that? You know what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So again, all round athletes with many different skills, inc- including things like pranayama. I feel like this multi-skill athlete is a trend that we're seeing everywhere in life, even in things like the science, sciences, etc. Everyone has to be hyper specialized now when yep. In the past, people were a little bit more well-rounded. And I don't know if it's just how, you know, society's kind of pushed us in that direction, but that seems to be a a trend outside of fitness as well. Yeah, I I mean, you're right. I think everybody now, I guess, I think it's got to do with a couple of things, you know. We're like approaching 8 billion people. So when there's that many people, it's easy to to blend in the crowd unless you do something special. Yeah. <laughs> and I think everybody is trying to say, Hey, look at me, you know? So in that respect, that's driving, I think being so specialized, um, that way you're actually valued in society. Um, hopefully have a, you know, financial reward for it too. But, um, in the past, I don't think, um, also there was much specialization simply because things have not been studied as in depth as they are now. We don't have the knowledge. Yeah. Back then, science wasn't as huge as it is now, where everything is dissected to the nth degree. You know, I know I'm a scientist, so you know y- you should read papers from the 1900s. There were short little reports that I could spit out in 10 minutes, and I and I could have a hundred. Uh, papers published in a month, you know, and, and, and now now to, to publish a paper, you need rigorous data, statistics, and mm-hmm. God knows, you know, hundreds of patients if you're doing clinical work or, or God knows what. The point is that to publish something nowadays needs to be so overanalyzed and peer-reviewed and everything under the sun has to be batted at it. So you need, you need to become truly specialized. Back then, things were, as I said, not as overanalyzed and therefore, you know, you didn't have that specialization you have nowadays. People could be much more broader. In that yeah, absolutely. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just throw out some topics and sure. just give me your first thought on it. We don't have to go too deep on this. So the sure. first one is... Uh, Frank Zane on how he developed his serratus. Abdominal work. He specifically the rope crunch. The rope crunch. Awesome. All right. Next one. Uh, Chuck Sipes' secret to massive forearms. Chuck Sipes curl. Was what's the what curl is that for people who don't know? Um, it's a specific one where. Oof. I can't exactly demonstrate it. <laughs> you have to bring your elbow all the way down and rest it on your leg. And, um, and yeah, just curl the weight. I can't show it, but you'll find it on, on Google. Or, and I've even done a, a video on it and stuff. So, yeah, it's, uh, it was used by him, Dave Draper, Arnold, everyone else. You know, they, they copied it. And it's a great, 
forearm builder. Yeah. Awesome. Um, next one. Why do gymnasts have massive arms? Well, there's why the monkeys have massive arms. They're hanging <laughs> all day long. Yeah. So, you know, basically it's got to do with time under tension. You know, they're, they're hanging and they're basically doing pull-ups and dips in a variety of fashions in different, you know, planes of motion, so to speak. And their muscles are going to grow to the absolute fullest using those very basic exercises. Awesome. So you had a, a quote that I found really interesting. It was, science is very limited. I think science being so specific cannot measure all the things that are going on in our very complex organism. Absolutely. Can you maybe expand on that in terms of how we should think about that through the lens of lifting? Well, I mean, there's so many factors in lifting. That's the problem. You're dealing with a complex organism. And my... I'm a scientist and I have a great respect for science. I've published many papers, been very successful in many projects, but the, the, when you, when you are given a project, you are given a very specific problem to solve under very specific conditions. Right. Um, and unless you nail those conditions specifically, and I tell you, because I've, I've had to do the impossible to, for example, I, a few years ago in 2019, I helped a, a firm here in Switzerland develop uh, the impossible assay, which, which um, for many decades could not be standardized, let alone be uh, a high throughput system. And under very specific conditions, I made it work. And now, of course, that took off. Um, and it was specifically for the development of of a liquid biopsy cancer. It was, a, it, was a, it was a liquid biopsy cancer assay, right, for the detection of cancer, of early cancer, actually. Um, why am I saying all this? Definitely not to brag, but to, to bring a, a point across, uh, to, to bring across the point that, um, that science, when it looks, when you see a result in science, right, you are looking at a very specific answer to a very, very specific question. And it does not take, into account all the variables that can that can occur that can distort that which will occur in everyday life because you don't have people in this world in a controlled environment you know they're, they're doing whatever the hell they want yeah you know and, and you're not saying no you're not allowed to drink this coffee this morning no you can't eat those chips no you've got to wake up at 6 a.m not at 8 a.m you can't do that and control people and so the results that are found in a scientific paper are not necessarily going to be a hundred percent is what I mean, applicable to every person in their everyday life. And if I give you another example, even when you look at statistics, have you heard of the bell curve? Of course. Okay. The result is generally given from that very specific area in the middle of the graph. They don't tell you that the graph itself could be skewed, mm. right? Or could be broad or could be a very specific peak. And if it is a very specific peak, which can be measured statistically, it's called the um, coefficient of variance. Um, if it's a very specific peak, okay, you can say this really worked for the majority of people. But if it's a broad peak, my God, you're missing out on the whole picture, aren't you? And you're yeah. only choosing the point that is satisfactory to your theory, to your hypothesis. And so this is why I said that, because I have the actual background to back up what I'm saying. Um, you know, science is very specific. And, and when we do statistics, for example, one of the first things we do to, 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 um, to data is we clean it up using methods that remove outliers. But outliers are data. Yeah, and sure, they might that. represent one to five percent, even ten percent of the data. But why exclude that? You know, why to make your theory work? <laughs> so, you know, but they are results, and these outliers are the people that you know. People will then go, no, that can't be possible because this paper said so. I'm sorry, <laughs> no, you're wrong. There's outliers in nature all the time, and that's why they're called outliers because they're not following the mainstream, the mainstream results or the mainstream 
dogmatic rule that's been laid on, you know. And uh, yeah, again, I'm ranting, but I hope I'm answering your question. I'm, you're answering the questions and I'm enjoying the rant, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm going to move into kind of a more tactical question here. What did old school bodybuilders get right about tricep development? Ooh, that's kind of a hard question because in all honesty, um, well, I'll give you an answer, actually. I think they got right the variety of movements, the use of free weight, the range of motion. That's what they actually got right now. That's a, that's a good question, and I do have a good answer for you. Uh, you, you go to a gym nowadays and you go, what are you going to work? Triceps. What do they do? Push they go to, yeah, overhead. that's it. Two, there's that's, like that's one or two exercises. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One or two exercises all in a vertical plane. Correct. That's it. Standing or sitting at best, right? And any variations of that are free weights, barbells or dumbbells, and maybe machines. And yeah, sure, nowadays they have those dip machines, um, you know, I see those seated ones where you push. Yeah. Okay? That's about it. And people know what they know. That's it. Maybe they have, you know, four or five exercises for triceps. The only variations might be the different bars that they've got. V bar, straight bar, rope pull down. That's it. Right. Um, whereas if you look back in the golden era, um, you know, <laughs> it's funny. The first time I ever uh, talked about the pullover extension where you actually lie down, and you bring your elbows all the way back and extend. Yep. It's not a pullover, but it's an actual extension. Okay. When you bring the, the elbows all the way back. People are like, you're not doing that right. And I said, why not? I'm moving the triceps in its full range of motion. Yeah. No, you're not. You're doing a pullover. Why are you bringing your elbows all the, back, all the way back behind your shoulders? Well, don't you know that the tricep attaches to the shoulder blade? Exactly. And you see this like their neurons die for a second, you know? <laughs> never thought about it. Of course. I never <laughs> thought about that. <laughs> then they, and, and some of them just like, don't get what you're talking about at all because they don't even understand, understand anatomy. Um, and so the range of motion was greater. And that goes the same with bicep curls. You, you ever do a bicep curl? Most people do this, but no one will bring their arm, arm up here or even further all the way up there. Yeah. Again, the bicep attaches to to the scapula right and so bringing the elbow up makes sense because it mo moves the biceps through its full range of motion which includes shoulder mobility same as the triceps so that's one thing the range of motion right the variety of movements we're talking standing lying sitting with a variety of exercises and planes of motion not just you know up and down or backing up, but even to the side, right? All these different exercises. Um, you look at Gironda's methods, even being perpendicular to the, uh, uh, parallel to the floor. Yep. You're actually bending over and doing either either racing dive extensions or um, something that I plan to reintroduce to the to the world in, in, in a few weeks is through my, um, I made replicas of all Vince's gym equipment uh, not all of it, but many of them. And I created the, the recreated the, the cradle bench, do cradle bench extensions. Oh my God, I did it the other day and my triceps were like sore, like I've never felt them in my life because uh, they fix, they, they kind of fix your, your, your triceps in a really behind the shoulder position. So I would say range of motion, range of what I'm getting to now is range of apparatuses. Not just range of bars, but range of apparatuses. Sure, mm -hmm. they had dip machines back then, but they had all these different specialized benches for them too, and specialized bars that you don't see like nowadays, like especially uh, Larry Scott's V bar, for example. Um, and as I said, side to side, also the the variety of of elbow motion. Most people understand that for the triceps, you can vary the elbow motion here, yeah, or here. But what about out to the sides, right? For example, the elbow out close grip extension or the elbow out V-bar push down, right? So again, people don't think about those things, right? <laughs> so yeah, variety of elbow placement. All these different things they did wonderful back then. And so does that have to 
does that influence the size and, and ma majesticness of their triceps back then? Maybe, maybe they were able to train it in a greater range of motion um, and therefore get more massive muscles or was it just genetics or the drugs they were using? I don't know, but I think they got tricep training way better back then than they do now to answer your question. Yeah. I think that's a real interesting thing to reflect on for people's workout plans. Like is everything you're doing in that vertical plane? I feel like that's a great thought exercise and then yeah. be like, okay, c could I add some variation just it's to try it out? It's yeah. Like Freddie Ortiz, you know, you, you look at Freddie Ortiz, you look at Arnold, you look at Larry Scott. Did you know that they varied their elbow position in, 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 in the actual barbell curl alone? It's not yeah. just this, but there's this version and there's this version, right? Yeah. And so it's it's about varying all planes of motion, right? And these guys were masters at this. They were root, true artists. They understood anatomy way better than people do nowadays. And, of course, they had no machines that said, you know, they had a little picture there that says, this is how you use the machine. This is the muscle that gets targeted. And you just follow what the little picture is saying there. Yeah. machine you know you no know, they actually had no machines no guidance they had to literally think about what they were doing and pick up an anatomy book and go okay this muscle has these many functions and this many movements and therefore if i can choose these movements i can do part of this movement or combine those two or those three you know like the bicep does it just bend at the elbow no, it also supinates at the it allows supination at the wrist, and the bicep also allows shoulder uh, fl uh, flexion. And yeah. so you've got three movements, right? Sure, you can do this movement alone. You can do this movement where you're supinating and bending. And if you want to take it to another level, you can combine all three. And so there is so much variation in that alone. Not not even then you know, doing all of those three with changing the elbow position. So you see what I mean? So there's all this stuff to, to really um, look at when you understand anatomy and you understand um, what can be done to affect, uh, uh, you know, muscle growth using a combination of an, anatomical principles. Yeah, I love that. Thinking about kind of variety instead of this is the one exercise that's most optimal which is the world we live in yeah. and it could be like if you do these five exercises with these different elbow variations and different planes of motion variations that whole system is going to be more optimal but don't think about everything so black and white as like this yeah, is the yeah. one but that's what everybody wants people have such a short attention span that they want everything simplified like a baby eating from you know a baby food uh a little bottle if you eat this you'll grow up no <laughs> you know it's not that simple uh, you know and that's the beauty of it if if you can if you can see the beauty of it in the its complexity in in the learning process and in the cultivation of your mind and body it's not just about simplifying everything so it's fitting in your perfect little square and you don't have to think about it no, dare to think. <laughs> so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw a few images on the screen mm -hmm. and I'll say who the person is and tell me what workout would you do if you met them in person? Oh, yeah. Sweet. All right. Let's start off with Arnold. Oh, man. Jesus. That's a tough one. I'm giving okay. you the hardest questions you've ever Arms, been. Arms, man. <laughs> Arnold's got to be arms. Yeah. Arms or chest. Definitely. Awesome. All right. Next one is Reg Park. Whoa, five by five. <laughs> <laughs> that was the easy one for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you trained with uh, one of his training partners? With his training partner, Mark yeah. Austin. Yeah. How was that? Well, I trained with Mark for a couple of years and I learned a lot of the principles from Reg Park. I mean, that was awesome. It was like a real silver era school, you know, awesome super, stuff. Super cool. All right, we got uh, Lou Ferrigno as the Lou. host here. Lou. Oh, my God. I don't know. Uh, back, I'd say, with, with Lou. Back, yeah. Awesome. Uh, so this one, we still have Lou, but we have uh, Chuck Norris here, too. Oh, come on, man. Spa. I'd spa with Chuck and get my ass kicked. <laughs> but it'd be awesome, <laughs> right? 
All right. And the last one here is uh, Neil from The Matrix. Oh, man. I-, I donned my um, Kung Fu outfit and uh, spa with, with, uh, with Keanu Reeves as well. <laughs> you could do Keanu and, and Chuck at the same time and see what happens. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I've got several black belts because I did martial arts for several for two decades um, and actually used to instruct in Australia. Um, but yeah, no, both of them at the same time, no, not happening. <laughs> awesome. I got one uh, last fun question here for you. So I'm someone who actually is a collector of some basketball memorabilia, and you obviously Ooh. have a ton of old school bodybuilding, bodybuilding memorabilia. What's your, your holy grail? The one thing you would love to get your hands on? Oh, I would love to get my hands on. <sighs> yeah. Steve Reeves' sand down. Nice. I was going to say, um, like, Arnold's Olympia trophy. But even greater than that is Steve Reeves' Mr. Universe sand down. Awesome. I know who owns it, but um, yeah, that's that, good. That's, maybe you'll get it in the next couple of decades. You never know. Maybe, how maybe. Are, right? It's it's kind of been said that I will, but I don't know whether that's ever going to happen. But yeah, that that would be that or I guess there is an or, uh, and that has kind of already been mentioned too. Uh, Vince's gym's original equipment. Oh, that'd be cool. You don't have to make replicas then. <laughs> that that's just beautiful stuff right there you know awesome we're, Carl- we're all the champions trained their blood sweat and tears is on that that's just legendary awesome well carl thank you so much for your time today and what you do for the community where can everyone find you well you can find me of course on my youtube channel golden era bookum.com which is hopefully with the next few weeks going to reach 100k <laughs> you're close and, um, <laughs> On my website, www.goldenerabookum.com. You can find me there, especially if you're interested in in my online coaching program. I don't teach many clients because I do one-on-one only. And um, I really invest my time in trying to make really beautiful transformations. So that's why I I keep it really close-knit. But it is open right now for for more uh, clients. And uh, on Instagram, of course, um, on goldenerabookum.com, you'll find me there too. I don't post as much on Instagram as I used to, but yeah, um, that's where you'll find me. Awesome. Thanks for your time, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, Vardon. Thank you so much for your time, and it's uh, been an awesome conversation. Awesome. <laughs>